Welcome to the IAAS Academy. In this video, I'm going to show you how to deploy a secure multi-tier application using AWS serverless technologies. We will not be using any traditional server-based infrastructure components, which have a lot of drawbacks for modern businesses that want to be more agile and gain a competitive edge. Some benefits of going serverless include not having to maintain or manage a fleet of servers. There's no need to patch them or install antivirus software. Serverless technologies also enable businesses to truly adopt a pay-as-you-consume model. This is different from a standard pay-as-you-go model, where in the latter, you pay for the service you provision, but you're still paying for those servers even if they are idle. With serverless technologies, you are charged for only the services you consume, such as when a piece of code is executed. This video presents a full hands-on demonstration on how to build and deploy your serverless architecture. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Rajesh and I am a senior solutions architect with over 20 years of experience in the IT industry. I've helped numerous clients migrate to the AWS cloud and I've worked with businesses across the US, UK and India. Over the last five years, I've delivered technical training programs on AWS. I'm also the author of the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Exam Guide, published by Pact Publishing and available on Amazon and major bookstores. Now I've designed this video for you to get the maximum possible practical hands-on benefit by applying the knowledge to deploying a real world use case scenario. And to that end, I've built this video around a fictitious company called Belly Brew Co. Limited. Let's take a look at what this company does and what its business requirements are. So let's set the scene and paint the scenario. Belly Brew Co. Limited is a manufacturing and distributor of gut-friendly beverages and ready meals across the United Kingdom through a chain of retail supermarkets, grocery stores, restaurants and coffee shops. Their mission statement states that they innovate gut-friendly meals and beverages offering a delicious fusion of nutrition and convenience. They're dedicated to transforming how you eat and drink, fostering well-being with every flavorful choice. That's a nice mission statement and that's a good beginning to something that is long-term and healthy. So let's take a look at Belly Brew's business requirement for the purposes of this demonstration. Now you've been hired as a solutions architect to come up with a solution to Belly Brew's requirement. And their primary goal for engaging with you is to help them develop customer awareness and brand loyalty with a focus on capturing additional market share across the ready meals and soft drinks industry. Now, that's a very broad and high level primary goal that the company has, and you've been hired to help them achieve this. When you work as a solutions architect for any company, you're going to go through a project life cycle that comprises of a series of different components to help build a solution to a problem or a business requirement. And as part of that project life cycle, one of the things that you're going to have to do is perform something called a requirements gathering exercise. Now, I'm not going to go into the depths of what that is exactly and how the mechanisms of that work, simply because I want to stay focused on helping you understand the technical aspect of deploying a serverless architectural solution. However, I felt it would be interesting if we just added some context to Belly Brew's requirement and see how you would use the requirements analysis part of it to build your solution. So I went ahead and on your behalf, did some interviews at Belly Brew Limited. And I wanted to provide you with some key insights into those interviews. And so one of the individuals that we spoke to was Ellie Brew. She's the CEO for Belly Brew Co. Limited, and she states that our marketing department would like you to design a cloud solution that would enable us to capture the names and email addresses of existing and new customers who may be interested in our product range. Our internal developers can work with you and build the required application code for the solution you propose and implement. So we've got some information here. You've been told that you are going to have the opportunity to work with some of the in-house developers to build an application or a solution where they need your help to design and implement and they would like to collaborate with you. Uh, and we know that one of the key fundamental requirements of this solution is a mechanism for capturing names and email addresses of both existing and potentially new customers that may be interested in the product range. Next, we spoke to Anisha Belly, and she is the marketing head at Belly Brew Co. Limited. Now, she says that we want to host a website with a subscription form that entices visitors to sign up to our newsletter. In return, we will give a free gut-friendly recipe book with over 100 recipes. 
The email addresses will be used for future marketing campaigns. The ebook must be delivered to the email address they use to sign up for the newsletter. Okay, so that's pretty clear. The in house developers are going to build a website. They would like to have a subscription form on that website. They would like to capture those email addresses and names and in return provide a free ebook. So we've got multiple things happening here. There's a front end website that encourages individuals to sign up and part with their names and email addresses. And in exchange for that key information, the company is willing to give a free ebook that contains over 100 recipes. Wow, pretty exciting. So they need a solution for that. We also went ahead and spoke to George Gutt, the chief technology officer. Um, right, I do apologize about choosing these rather weird surnames, but let's stick with the actual story. So George, he's our CTO, and he says that we're looking for a solution where we do not have administration and management overhead. Due to limited budgets, I cannot allocate more IT engineers to patch, update, and maintain servers. Who wants to do that anyway? The solution must be secure, scalable, and resilient. I also want to ensure that the ebook is only available to genuine signups. Now we have lots of information here. Firstly, they want to avoid all of the management overhead that's associated with server-based architectures, patching, updates, installing antivirus products, making sure that you have the right set of servers with the right set of resources on them, the amount of CPU, memory, all that stuff. Secondly, we want to make sure that only genuine signups, only individuals who really sign up for the newsletter are the ones that receive the ebook. So we've got to think about how we deliver this ebook in a more secure fashion rather than just making it available as a link on the website, for example. So next, what I'd like to do is just take a look at a high level overview about how this workflow is going to take place from a potential customer out on the internet subscribing to this newsletter and getting the ebook. Let's do that next. Okay, so let's take a look at a high level overview about how this workflow would work with the application from a user subscribing to the newsletter through to getting this ebook. So we'll start off by taking a look at obviously our user and I've picked up a random name here. So we've got Gemma who's a potential customer or maybe even an existing customer. What she does is she connects to our website. So this will be the front end of the application that's going to try and capture her name and email address. There is a form on the website that she will fill up, subscribe for a free recipe ebook. Okay, so she'll put a name and her email address and hit that submit button. Now, when she hits the submit button, we need to add business logic and some sort of compute element to it to do something with that information. And in order to facilitate that, we'd need to run some code, some application code on a particular compute service, such as an EC2 instance. There's a number of things that need to happen with that piece of information. Firstly, that information needs to be deposited into a database so that the marketing team at Belly Brew Limited can go ahead and consume that information in order to send out their mass emails and campaigns and all that jazz. Next, the compute service needs to create some sort of an email um, that will be sent to the user. And in that email, we need to have some information to access that particular ebook. Remember, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, we wanted to be able to send an email and then with that email, they'll be able to access the ebook. So this email contains the link to the ebook and then Gemma can go ahead and capture the actual recipe book using that link. Ultimately, she will then get the recipe book and be a happy either an existing or potential customer. And that's the overall workflow of what you're going to be building next. Now, the next thing I want to look at is exactly the mechanism by which we can deliver this email and more importantly, how Gemma will actually access the ebook. Now, before we go any further, I want to reiterate the requirements from our CTO. OK, so if you remember, George was pretty much clear that he wanted to ensure that the solution that we built was secure, scalable and resilient and to ensure that the ebook is only available to genuine signups. His other requirement was that we don't want to manage infrastructure. So we don't want to be managing servers. We don't want to be managing databases or any of that stuff. We want to reduce the overall infrastructure administration and management overhead. So next, what I want to do is I want to address the requirement of ensuring that the ebook is only available to genuine signups. Now, there's only so much you can actually do in the real world. OK, there's nothing to stop Gemma from actually sending a copy of this ebook to her friends. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we make it as secure as possible. And I'd like to discuss a potential solution 
that can help us achieve that. Let's do that next. And so if we take a look at Gemma again, Gemma goes ahead and subscribes for the newsletter. And in return, she's hoping to get that wonderful ebook. And at the back end, a piece of compute service and application code will send her an email that will contain the link to the ebook that she can download. Now, in this particular case, what I would suggest and what you would probably already guessed anyway, is to use an Amazon S3 bucket to host the actual recipe book. And the reason why we would use an Amazon S3 bucket is because an Amazon S3 bucket allows you to publish objects out on the internet. It allows you to grant access using standard REST APIs as, as well as standard HTTP and HTTPS endpoints in order to access a specific particular object. You can't really do that very easily with block storage and, and file storage. And obviously there may be other ways of doing that, but ultimately the quickest and easiest way to handle object delivery over a public domain, such as the internet, would be to store them in an S3 bucket and make them accessible to whoever needs them. The key thing about this particular design pattern is that now Gemma actually needs permission to download this object. And by default, you can set up a set of permissions that allow Gemma to get hold of the object. There's a problem, however, with this specific set of permissions because we need to put the actual object into an S3 bucket and make it publicly accessible so that users simply by sharing their name and email address can access the object. We have to make the particular object accessible anonymously. So you'll note in the policy there, we've got a principle set to a wildcard, which means anybody out on the internet can access this object. And as long as you have the link, you're free to go and retrieve the object. So it's a get request and the principle is set to a wildcard. The effect is allow. And obviously I've just removed where I'm storing that particular link over there, but I am essentially making this object accessible out on the public internet to anyone who has the link. Now, there is a problem with this approach, however, in that our friend Gemma could decide to post this link on social media websites. You know, she feels generous. She wants to share it with all her friends and family, and that's fantastic. And so now anybody with the link can go ahead and get hold of the free recipe ebook, which kind of like goes against our CTO's requirements. We need to put a stop to that. Let's do that next. So one solution to our problem is to use something called pre-signed URLs. A pre-signed URL uses security credentials to grant time-limited permissions to download or upload objects. The URL can be entered into a browser or used by a program to download an object. And the credentials used by the pre-signed URL are those of the AWS user who generated the URL. So we've got our user here, Gemma, our customer, who's gonna to go to our website and sign up for our newsletter and in return, get the ebook. In the back end, there's going to be an application that's going to process that request and generate a pre-signed URL, in this case, as an example, with an expiry of one hour. And if we take a look at a screenshot, you can generate pre-signed URLs directly from within the AWS Management Console. You can also use the CLI and you can use the SDKs. But you can see that you can specify the time limit for that URL, the expiry for that URL, and select the object that you're trying to create the URL for, and AWS will generate the pre-signed URL for you. The application can interact with the service in order to do this for you programmatically as well. And so ultimately, an email will be created with the pre-signed URL that grants temporary access to this object with an expiry timeframe. Gemma can then access the actual object as long as she does it within the time allocated and she'll get a link similar to what you're looking at on the screen. And you can see this link is a lot more different than your standard web link, which allowed anonymous access. It has some token information there. There's an expiry there in 3,600 seconds with the necessary credentials, which is a temporary set of credentials as well. And now Gemma, if she were to post this particular link onto a social media platform, yes, People have an hour to start downloading it, but then we can obviously reduce the time for the expiry as well. Let's talk a little bit more about pre-signed URLs. You can generate a pre-signed URL programmatically using the command line interface or the AWS SDKs. 
Now a pre-signed URL remains valid for the period of time specified when the URL is generated and if you created the pre-signed URL with the console, you can set the expiration time to anything between 1 minute to 12 hours. If you use the CLI or the SDKs, you can have the expiration time as high as 7 days. Okay, so that addresses one of our concerns from the CTO, which is we're trying to reduce the possibility of this link just going viral and being used by everyone else. And hopefully it'll encourage more people to actually part with their names and email addresses before they get access to the ebook. Let's look at the next requirement that the CTO had for us. Okay, so the next requirement was that we didn't want any kind of infrastructure administration or management overhead. Now, obviously, when you're building a solution on the AWS platform, whether it's server-based or serverless, there's going to be some level of administration. But when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to underlining server-based infrastructure, there's a lot more overhead associated with it. In a typical architectural design, you would build several components, and I'm just listing some of those components in this diagram here. You obviously need to build a network, so that's your VPC. So you've got to take care of things like the firewall rules, decide how you're going to place your subnets, what sort of traffic you're going to permit, and then someone needs to ensure that that is being monitored and fulfills all of the corporate policies and the security requirements. Not to mention that within a standard infrastructure required for the compute and database services, you would provision perhaps some virtual service. So these are EC2 instances on the AWS platform, and you may well split that between a front-end and a back-end component in order to fulfill best practices and adhere to um, industry standards. So you've got your web front end that presents the presentation layer, you know, the, the website where the user goes and sees that fancy uh, form and the enticement to actually part with their details. And then the back end that does all of the business logic and the processing of the information that's submitted. So in this case, obviously, we're going to put some of that information into a database. Now we're using an RDS database over here. And so that's another um, aspect to consider. When it comes to these servers, obviously, these are pay-as-you-go servers. They are virtual servers. You don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure. However, you still have a big responsibility when it comes to ensuring that the servers are secure, that they're regularly patched, that you're using the correct operating system, that you perform any upgrades of the actual components of that server in terms of you know the software layer. But also, depending on the type of traffic that comes through the front door, how you scale those servers out. Now, you could use auto scaling, obviously, in order to you know scale out and scale back in on demand, but that too requires an element of management overhead and administration efforts. Same applies for the backend app layer as well. In terms of the database, if you're going for an RDS database, yes, RDS databases are fully managed in the sense that, you know, all of the updates and stuff like that is taken care of by AWS, but you're still responsible for deciding what type of database engine you're going to use, the actual DB instance size, which defines the performance level of that database, the amount of storage that you're going to allocate to that database. And so there is an element of administrative overhead there. So like I said, we're not looking at the full details of a typical server-based infrastructure in this diagram, but I wanted to highlight some of the infrastructure components that as an end consumer, you'd be responsible for taking care of and administering. And this is something we want to avoid as per the requirements from George, our CTO. So let's take a look at the serverless alternatives to some of these infrastructure components that is going to be vital to support our server-based application next. Okay, so let's take a look at some serverless alternatives that we can use in order to fulfill the requirements of Belly Brew Company Limited. So the first one is to talk about the front end website and the recipe book storage service. Now on the left, we're using a web server and this web server is connected to obviously some storage volume, such as block storage. It may also be connected to some file storage, especially if it needs to share any kind of files with its fleet members. So normally when you deploy an EC2 instance, you wouldn't just deploy the one instance, you will deploy multiple instances to load balance your traffic. And ideally you would place them across multiple availability zones. All of that adds to your administrative overhead. In addition to that, the key fundamentals here to understand is that this web server is going to obviously play the role of your web services. It's going to present your front end web application that has the form in it. And 
the server that you provision or the servers that you provision will be running most probably 24 by 7, seven days a week. There may be times when nobody is busy accessing your website. OK, there may be times when nobody is actually subscribing to your newsletters. At those times, that server is sitting idle and you're wasting a lot of money. Amazon S3 has a feature that allows you to host static websites on the actual bucket itself. Now, when we say static websites, the immediate feeling is that, oh, well, it must be limited. Not really. When you think about the actual presentation layer, all you need is the actual static web interface. And when it comes to actually filling up the form and hitting the submit button, that is actually a process where we call different methods that can trigger some APIs, which we'll talk about in a second. So a static website, an Amazon S3 bucket functioning as a static website can provide all of the functionality you need that that web server is providing with the presentation layer, with the front end website layer. In addition to that, you can have a separate bucket to host your actual recipe book. So this is the book repository. And we mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that you can restrict access to the S3 bucket using pre-signed URLs. Okay, so next on our list of comparisons and alternatives, we can think about the compute services and the business logic. Remember, we mentioned earlier that you potentially want to separate out your front end from your back end business logic layer and you would have front end web servers and then you would have back end app servers. So in this case, you would also again deploy EC2 instances. And again, the problem with deploying EC2 instances is the additional management overhead, the patching, the updates and all of that stuff, but also the fact that it's far less cost effective. OK, instead, you could opt for deploying Lambda functions. Now, Lambda is an event driven compute service that's fully managed and entirely serverless. There are no underlining servers for you to manage whatsoever. No patching, no updates, no, in no installations of antivirus software, none of that stuff. More importantly, Lambda is charged on a per execute model. So every time your code executes, you're charged on it. So there isn't that cost wastage when the servers are running idle during the middle of the night. So Lambda can be used to add the business logic for your incoming request as users sign up for that newsletter. And then we also have obviously databases. Now we spoke about Amazon RDS in the earlier slide and we said that yes, Amazon RDS is a fully managed database service, but it does come with some level of administration. You do need to make decisions on, you know, the instance size, the the type, the engine, the amount of storage. There is some level of administration involved in it. DynamoDB, on the other hand, a NoSQL database is a fully managed, completely serverless architecture. You do need to, however, make a decision on how you're going to provision resources on a DynamoDB table. You need to specify write capacity units and read capacity units, which involves opting for a provisioned environment. However, you can also go with an on-demand approach that allows the service to automatically provision the necessary resources for you. But you don't need to make decisions on what instance size to use, what type to use. You don't need to, you know, worry about things like the amount of storage you're going to allocate. That's all taken care of for you. Now, in addition to these particular components for your application architecture, there are a couple of other services that we'll be using in our design plan. And let's take a look at that next. OK, so let's take a look at some additional serverless technologies that you will actually be using as part of our design plan for this serverless architecture design. And specifically, the first service that you're going to look at is API Gateway. Now, Amazon API Gateway is a fully managed service that makes it easy to create, publish, maintain, monitor and secure your APIs at any scale. The API Gateway service essentially acts as a front door for applications to access data, business logic, functionality from your backend services. So all of that stuff where, you know, you need to create pre-signed URL. So you need the Lambda function, add stuff to a database and then trigger an email to be sent across. All of those functionalities in the backend can be handled through the API Gateway as requests. Using API Gateway, you can create HTTP APIs, RESTful API and WebSockets APIs that enable real-time two-way communication applications. And API Gateway supports containerization, serverless workloads, and standard web applications. So with your API Gateway, you can create, publish, and secure your APIs. And as I mentioned, they act as the front door to your backend services. 
API Gateway can process thousands of concurrent APIs. They can manage your traffic. It also offers cross-origin resource sharing support, okay, as well as authorization. In addition to that, it facilitates decoupling between your front-end and back-end services. It integrates with security tools like web application firewalls to protect your application from malicious attacks. And finally, it also supports throttling, which is a critical feature to ensure that you avoid distributed denial of service attacks as well as caching support. Now with caching support, you restrict the number of requests hitting your backend services, which has two key benefits. One is it reduces the possibility of bombarding your backend services with unnecessary requests. And again, another security measure. But in addition to that, when you're making requests from backend services, like trying to run a Lambda function or posting stuff on your database and stuff like that, that all adds to your cost. So if you've got a caching support element in place, then that reduces your overall cost. Now, if you think about it, you could design this architecture without using API Gateway and directly send your request to a Lambda function. But there are several problems with that. The biggest reason why you want to expose your services through API Gateway rather than Lambda is because you want to expose your services as REST services. There's a lot of the security elements to this design architecture and you'd be following industry standard best practices to facilitate decoupling between your front end and back end services. In fact, let's say tomorrow, if you decide to change the architecture and swap out your Lambda functions for containerization using Elastic Container Services, you can easily make the switch without having to change your front end code. So you add that decoupling element, that loose coupling element to your design architecture, which is always a recommended practice. In addition to that, you can have regional endpoints and use Route 53 to route traffic to those regional endpoints. Whereas with regional lambdas, you need to bake in regional redirection into your application code, which isn't something you want to be doing. So there are lots of benefits to using API Gateway in this design. The next serverless technology that I want to talk to you about is the Amazon Simple Email Service, the Amazon SES service. Now, now this service offers a fully managed serverless email solution ideal for marketing campaigns. It can integrate well into your application stack through API calls. It also offers extensive amount of security elements such as securing your emails with sender policy framework, a means of authenticating where that email comes from. DMARC or DKIM protection as well. Okay, so this covers the overall architectural components that you're gonna be using in order to build your solution. Now we've covered a lot of theory, okay, about the different technologies and we've compared server-based services with serverless services. What I wanna do next is put all of these pieces together and give you an architectural design plan. Let's do that now. Okay, so next let's take a look at the serverless architecture design that you can build following our step-by-step -step guide. So. We have our customer. Our customer needs to be able to access the front end of this website that has the form in it where she can subscribe for the newsletter and subsequently in return get the ebook. So the user will access the Belly Brew static website. The application code for the static website is provided to you in the resources section of this video or in the description below. Next, the user will submit a subscription form, filling it up with the name and email address and will invoke API Gateway. So API Gateway will act as the front door, as we previously discussed, that will trigger a Lambda function. Now the Lambda function will have a host of different tasks to perform in this particular instance. And in order to facilitate that, it does need the appropriate roles. So we will also be configuring an IAM role that will give the Lambda function the necessary permissions to perform all the tasks that it needs to perform. And these tasks include the ability to add new items into the table, into a DynamoDB database table, this will comprise of the name and email addresses of all of those who sign up for the newsletter. Interact with the private bucket that contains the recipe to generate a pre-signed URL, again, with the necessary permissions from the IAM role. And subsequently, queue an email on Amazon SES, the simple email service, so that an email can be triggered and the email with the link can be sent to the user. Remember, this link is going to be a pre-signed URL link which will have a expiry date and will also have temporary credentials embedded in the link. So for this, you will need access to an AWS account where you should be logged in with administrative rights so that you can perform all of the necessary tasks. Now the Lambda function code, as well as the HTML document 
that powers the front end of this application is all available to you in our GitHub repository, the link of which is provided to you in the resources section of this video or in the description. So feel free to first connect to our GitHub repository, download all of the application code, and then join me in the AWS Management Console next. Now, before we actually jump into the AWS Management Console, I just want to walk you through the agenda of what we'll be setting up. So this is our architecture. We've gone through this already. You've seen exactly the different components. We'll actually look at each individual component and then we'll go into the AWS Management Console and set up that component. In terms of the actual steps that we're going to follow, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an Amazon S3 bucket that will host the recipe book. This is the book that is going to be stored in a bucket that is private. OK, and the only way to access it is if you have the pre-signed URL. Next, we're going to set up the DynamoDB table. Now, this table is going to be used to actually store all of the data that we get from the users. So that's predominantly the name and email addresses of anyone who signs up for the ebook that can subsequently be used by the marketing department for all of their campaigns. Step three is we'll go into the simple email service. Now, the simple email service is a fully managed email solution. And what we'll need to do is just configure it so that it can send emails to a specific email address. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when we actually jump into that console. Step four is to define an IAM policy and IAM role for AWS Lambda. So Lambda is going to be at the forefront of this entire application architecture. Lambda is the one that's going to take the data from the website when a user submits their details and then post it into the database, generate the pre-signed URL and queue the email in SES to be sent across to the end user. And for that to happen, Lambda needs permissions. It needs to talk to the DynamoDB table. It needs to talk to the S3 bucket, all that stuff. We need a role that Lambda will use with the necessary permissions. Step five is to actually then create the Lambda function and obviously associate that role we created in step four with the Lambda function. Step six is then to build the HTTP API with API Gateway. And that's going to be where when you hit the submit button on the form on your website, it basically invokes an API call on API Gateway. And I'll show you how to do that as well. Step seven is then we go back to Amazon S3 and we create a static website hosting. So we'll create another bucket that will be actually used to host the website. That will be the front end presentation layer for the end consumer, the end user, who will be enticed to part with their details in return for the recipe book. And finally, step eight, well, we need to test the application and make sure it all works so that, you know, this application is complete. And the first thing we're going to do is set up that S3 bucket to host that recipe book. So that is our first step. Let's go into the AWS Management Console. OK, so this is my AWS Management Console. Now I'm creating all of this in the North Virginia region. If you do create in a different region, there are a few changes that you will need to make uh, specifically around some environmental variables, which you'll see later on for now. What we're going to do is we're going to create that S3 bucket. So you can search for S3 in the box up here. I've recently accessed S3, so, so it's visible in the recently visited section. So I'll just go into Amazon S3. And I'm going to create a bucket that's going to store my book repository, my recipe book. So if I click on buckets and click on create a bucket, um, again, I'm making sure that it's in the North Virginia region. I'll give it a bucket name. OK, something like that. Belly Brew Recipe Book. Um, scroll down all the way. I'm going to leave everything else as it is. This is going to be a private bucket, so I'm not going to untick this box. And I will leave everything else as it is and click Create Bucket. OK, so that's my bucket. And what we're going to do next is we're going to actually upload our recipe book. Now, let me just quickly take you to the GitHub repository as well, just to show you where everything is. OK, this is our GitHub repository. You will find the link in the description below. The one that you want is serverless app. And these are the files you want to download. So the belly brew HTML zip, the book.zip and the lambda.zip. Now, I've actually downloaded all of these onto my local computer as well. Um, you want to make sure that you extract the belly brew HTML zip file as well as the books.zip file. Um, once you've downloaded them onto your computer. So let me just bring up my local repository of the same files. And I'll just go back to the S3 bucket as well. 
Now, when you are actually copying these files, you want to make sure you do it exactly as um, I'm doing it here. So once you've extracted the books.zip file, you get books as a folder and within it, another folder called books and then the actual recipe book. You want to make sure that you actually copy the folder that contains the books, okay, into your S3 bucket so that you have a books prefix followed by book.pdf, okay? So book.pdf is in the books folder and then click upload. Now, if you make any changes to the actual hierarchy of your repository, then likewise, you would need to update the environmental variables, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But otherwise, if you follow this through step by step in the same way as I'm doing it, you wouldn't have to make much changes to the upcoming um, uh, demonstrations. OK, so now we have uploaded this. I'm going to click close and we can take a quick look at this. So we've got the belly brew recipe book bucket within it. We've got the books folder and the book.pdf key or file name, if you will, of the actual object. OK, so that's step one done. OK, so step two is to go ahead and deploy our DynamoDB table. This is going to be the database that is going to host the end users details, their name and email addresses. OK, so back to my AWS Management Console, what we need to do is we need to go into DynamoDB. Now, if you search for DynamoDB from the search box over here and open that up in another tab, it allows you to quickly and easily switch between tabs because you will find that you will need to do that. So from the left hand side, we've got our DynamoDB menu system. If we go into tables, you're going to basically create a DynamoDB table. So we'll create a table. We need to give the table a name. I'm going to call this one profile table only because it's storing the profile of potential and existing customers. And that's their name and email addresses. The next thing you need to do is define a partition key. Now, a partition key is basically like the table's primary key. It's a key that uniquely identifies every record in a table, which means that every key is unique. OK, and so you need to select some form of attribute that will be used as the partition key. For the purposes of this simple example, we can use something like email because every user will have one email that's going to be unique and that's you're going to uniquely identify them. And that obviously is going to be a string in terms of the data type, but you can also have numbers and binary and so on. There's also something called a sort key, okay, um, which allows you to provide a second element to your primary key, allowing you to create ranges for your different uh, records that you have. So for example, an author could have several books associated with him or her. And so by using a combination of a partition key, the author's name, for instance, uh, or the author's email address, uh, you can actually have a situation where you can uniquely identify every book by knowing A, the author's email address, and their book name. So that could be your combination of your partition key, your primary key, and your sort key. But for this simple exercise, all we need is a simple primary key. We're gonna use email to identify every user that submits their details on this database. Okay, so next is all about capacity provisioning. Now the default, which is the quickest way of setting this up, is to define a set of capacity units, what we call read capacity units and write capacity units. Um, a default setting of five RCUs and five WCUs are provisioned for you if you did the default settings, but you could customize that and either go for a DynamoDB standard um, configuration or a DynamoDB standard IA, which is where the data is stored in infrequently accessed storage, which will obviously be cheaper. When it comes to the actual capacity, if you know the amount of capacity units that you need, then you can provision that as well. Or you can go with the on-demand approach where you simply are built for the actual read and write capacity units that your application consumes. OK, um, we won't go too deep into this. Um, obviously, that's, uh, you know, content for another video. So I'm just going to leave it at default settings and go ahead and create the table. And so now what's happening is the DynamoDB table is getting created for you. That's going to host all of that customer data. In other words, their names and email addresses. And if I quickly refresh this page, you should find that that is now up and running, ready to go. OK, so the next step is step three, where we're going to set up Amazon Simple Email Service or Amazon SES. Amazon SES is a fully managed email solution that enables you to do things like mass mail messaging. And for the purposes of our use case is going to be used to send across emails to anyone who signs up for this ebook. 
And what we're going to be doing is just setting up the SES service for now. We'll connect to it later on. So let's jump back into the AWS Management Console. So here we are on the AWS Management Console. I'm just going to search for the SES service and open that up in another browser tab and navigate to that tab. Now, when you're setting this up, you're setting this up in a sandbox environment. If you want to set this up for production where you can send emails to absolutely anybody who signs up for your SBA book, you would need to set up a production environment on SES. OK, and to do that, you would have to follow the get setup page. So you need to click on that link, which will give you a form to fill out that will allow you to give your use case to Amazon Web Services to set up this for production purposes. Amazon will then go through it. If they've got any questions, we'll get in touch with you. Otherwise, if everything is all OK, they will set up a production environment for you and then you'll be able to send emails across within specified limits and within certain uh, parameters and guidelines as part of your mass messaging solution. Because we're not going to set that up, we're just setting up a lab environment. All you need to do for the purposes of this lab is go down on your left hand side to verify identities. We're basically going to set up one email address that we'll send an email to with the link. OK, so that we can just test how the application works. So for that, you click create identity. You could create an entire domain. I don't have one for the purposes of this lab just yet. I'm just going to create an email address that I'm going to verify. So SES will be sending emails to that email address and will not you know, stop the emails going out. So I'll just put in my email address there. It's just a Gmail address. And then you click Create Identity. Now, when you do it this way, you need to verify the identity. So you'll need to log into your email account. So I'll just do that now. Just logged into my Gmail account there. And you can see I've received an email from Amazon Web Services that says we've received a request to authorize this email. So we need to click on this link. And once we click on the link, we get the congratulations message. Now, if I go back to my SES page and click on verify identities, you will see that, in fact, the identity status is verified. OK, so that is the SES part of the architecture set up and configured. OK, so the next step is step four. Now, this is where we're going to define an IAM policy and rule for AWS Lambda. Remember, Lambda needs a set of permissions to do all the wonderful things it's going to be doing. Within our architecture, we're going to now go into IAM and set up that role that will be used by AWS Lambda. Let's go back to the AWS Management Console. OK, so back to our AWS Management Console, we're going to go into the IAM dashboard this time. I'm going to again open that up in a different tab. So here we are. And what we're going to be doing is creating an IAM policy. Now, the policy that we're going to be creating, and I'm going to show you this policy in a second, it's available to you in our GitHub repository. Make sure you've downloaded it as well. And this is the policy here. So essentially what we're doing with this policy is we're saying we're going to allow a set of things to happen. We're going to allow the ability to put items into a DynamoDB table. We're going to allow the ability to get objects from our S3 bucket. And we're going to allow the ability to send email through the SES service. And you will notice that from a resource perspective, we can restrict exactly which resources we work with. So for this policy, for the DynamoDB put item action, we're going to replace this placeholder with the tables ARN, the profile table that we created. And we're going to replace this placeholder with the ARN of the bucket that contains our recipe book. So the first thing I'm going to do is quickly just copy this. Make sure to include all of the brackets there and go back to our policy. Click Create Policy. And then you want to click on the JSON tab and replace this entire default policy in there. And then you want to make sure that you are setting this up correctly. OK, so we want to replace the table ARN. So we know that we've got our DynamoDB table there. There's our profile table. And if you look under additional info, you will find that table ARN is just there. So just copy that. Let's go back to our policy and we're going to place that in there. OK, make sure that it's within the speech marks, the quotation marks. Same thing we need to do for the bucket. So our bucket is, in fact, called Belly Brew Recipe Bucket. OK, and again, with that one, we also have to put the ARN of the bucket name. So if I go back to the bucket, 
if I click on the bucket itself, okay, and go down to properties, there's the ARN of the bucket. So we're gonna put that value in there as well. You'll notice that it's got the slash book slash everything. So obviously you wanna make sure that that hierarchy is exactly the way how you've set it up in your bucket. And then that should all clear. And then what you wanna do is click next. So I'm gonna call this one belly brew submit handler policy, okay? So it's for our function, for our Lambda function. And then you wanna go ahead and click create policy. Okay, so that creates the policy for you. So if I just type in belly brew there, you'll see that the policy has been created. The next step is to actually create the role for the Lambda function. So you click on roles, and what we're gonna do is click create a new role. AWS service, so which service are we gonna be working with? This time it's gonna be the Lambda service. So we're creating a role for Lambda. Click next. And we're gonna attach that policy that we just created. So belly, brew, submit handler policy. And I'm gonna click next on that one. And then we're gonna give this role a name. And this one I'm gonna call it belly, brew, submit handler role. Okay, and obviously you can give some description there. And what this does is it gives the Lambda function the ability to assume this role which has this policy attached to it that has all those permissions it needs to function correctly. So we create the role and that's the role created. So you've got your policy created and your role created with the policy now attached to it. Okay, let's move on to the next step. Okay, so step number five is to go ahead and create the Lambda function. And that's where we're gonna jump on into the Lambda console and we set up the Lambda function. We've provided you with the Lambda function code, which I'll roughly go through and you can take a look at the code. And obviously you need to copy this from our GitHub repository. While creating the Lambda function, we'll also be attaching the role that we had set up in IAM for Lambda to use so that it can access those services in the back end, the DynamoDB, the S3 bucket, the SES services, etc. Right, back to the management console. Okay, so here we are on the AWS management console and I'm gonna go into Lambda. So we'll open that up in another tab. So this is your Lambda management console. And from the left-hand side, what we're gonna do is just go into the dashboard. You'll see currently there are no functions running there. So we're gonna create a function and we're gonna create a function from scratch. You need to give this a name. So I'm gonna call this the belly brew submit handler function, okay? So this is the actual function. Now the code for Lambda has been written in Python. Specifically, you wanna be selecting Python 3.9. And then you also want to click here where it says change default execution role. Instead of the default one, you want to use the existing role, the role we created in IAM. So make sure you select the belly brew submit handler role. Don't need to worry about anything else. Go ahead and click create function. So the function has been created and now you'll be presented with the area where you need to upload the code. Let me show you the code very quickly. Okay, so this is the Lambda code. Okay, so the Lambda code has been designed in such a way so that you can create environmental variables to inject into the code rather than having to hard code the actual function with the necessary parameters. And this is a good idea because what it means is that all you need to do is make changes to the environmental variables if you change the backend services and environment. So you will notice at various places there are placeholders. So there's the bucket bookstore region that we need to specify the region in which to operate in. Uh, there is also, for instance, if we scroll a little bit down, you know, you've got the bookstore bucket, the bookstore key, which is the actual name of the recipe book. All of those stuff are being obtained from the environment of variables, which we'll set up in a second. But essentially, you've got different areas of this code that you are welcome to review. So you've got the function to actually set up the pre-signed URL from that bucket for that object. You've got step three, which is to send transactional emails with the pre-signed URL. So that's where it interfaces with Amazon SES and takes the next step to send across that and so on. Um, and so this is what you want to do. You want to copy this entire code and paste it in here. So we'll just replace that and paste it in there. Okay, so that's your code pasted. Um, you don't need to make any changes to the code whatsoever. 
uh, just go ahead and click deploy. Now that we've deployed the code, we need to set up the configuration, specifically the environmental variables, so that those placeholders can be filled from the environmental variables attributes. And if we click on configuration and on the left hand side, click on environmental variables, this is where you set that up. So there are a number of variables that you need to set up. Let's click on add. So the first environmental variable is from email address. Okay, so where's the actual email coming from? From email underscore address. You need to make sure you do it exactly as you see on the screen. So in capital letters, because that's how the function is also retrieving it. And the value for that is the actual email where this uh, email is coming from. Okay, so I'm just going to put in my email address there. Next environmental variable that you're going to need is the bookstore bucket underscore bucket. Now the bookstore bucket is basically the name of the bucket that contains the recipe book. Okay, so in this case, it's the belly brew recipe book. Okay, make sure that you get this exactly right. So belly brew recipe book. Okay, otherwise we're going to have a problem. Add another environment variable. The next one is the actual key or the name of the object that we're going to create a pre-signed URL for. So bookstore underscore book underscore key. And this is in the books folder or prefix slash book.pdf if you remember the hierarchical structure of that object that is in our bucket. Next, we need to specify the bookstore region. Where is this recipe book located? So book store underscore bucket underscore region. And I'm operating in US East one, which is the North Virginia region. So make sure you get that one right. And then finally, there's one more variable to create, and that's the profile underscore table underscore name, which is the name of the DynamoDB table, which is profile table. Make sure you get that spelling right as well. So that's all my environment variables. So the next thing to do is click save. OK, and that's all configured there. Going back to the code, make sure that the code is all OK. OK and ensure that there are no red X's. Maybe you copied it incorrectly. So just make sure you've got all of that in place. Right, that is the function created. Let's move on to the next step. Okay, let's move on to step six, building the HTTP API with the API gateway. Okay, so essentially in this step, what we're gonna be doing is configuring the API gateway and also setting up the integration with the Lambda function that we just created. Okay, so we'll build the API and we'll also define the integration so that it knows which Lambda function to call. Let's jump back into the AWS Management Console. Okay, so here we are. Uh, let's go into API Gateway. So I'll open that up in another tab as well. And you're presented with this screen over here, Amazon API Gateway. So what we need to do is we're going to be building an HTTP API. You can also build a WebSockets API for things like chat applications and dashboards, REST API for more complex applications. OK, so let's go ahead and click on build on the HTTP API. And the first thing you need to do is define the integration. So we click on integration and we're integrating with Lambda. Make sure you're in the right region. Make sure the API has been created in the right region. And you want to select the correct Lambda function, which is the belly brew submit handler function. OK, leave that at version two. And then we need to give it an API name. So something like belly brew submit handler endpoint API. OK, and then click Next. And what we're going to be doing is you need to define the method, what it is you're actually going to be doing. So the method here is going to be a post method because essentially you are posting the contents from that form. And then in the resource part, all you need to do is get rid of that one and just put a slash submit. OK, so you're submitting. That's your resource part and it's integrating and calling that Lambda function, Okay, which is already in there. So then click Next. 
leave the stage at default. So stages basically allow you to create multiple environments. So things like, you know, dev, test, pre-prod, prod, that kind of stuff. Um, so just leave this as it is. Obviously in real world environments, you'll be building different stages. Um, click next and you've got everything else in place and then click create. This creates your API, okay? Um, so that endpoint has now been created. And if you actually go into the API Belly Brew Submit Handler, this invoke URL is critical. This is what is going to be called when someone hits that submit button. Okay, so you need to just make a note of that, which we'll use shortly. So that's your API configured. Okay, and you'll make and you will need this invoke URL. Let's move on to the next step. This is step seven, probably the most exciting part of this overall architecture design, because after this, we're going to see exactly how it works. OK, so in step seven, we're going to deploy a static website with Amazon S3. And that is basically where we deploy another S3 bucket, which will configure with static website hosting. And specifically, you need to make sure that the website code itself has a mechanism to invoke the API. So remember when we set up the API gateway, we got an API invoke URL. That invoke URL needs to be injected into your application code so that the application knows which API to invoke when the user hits the submit button. Okay, so before we actually jump on and take a look at the actual setup for the static website, I want to show you the application code and the specific line that you need to update before you can actually set this all up. So let's go take a look at the website application code next. OK, so this is the application that you downloaded. Remember, you downloaded the zip file, the book zip file, etc. Um, if you extract that, if you extract the zip file and go into the fold itself, that's where your front end static website exist. Okay, it's got the HTML documents, the index and error.htmls. It's got some JavaScript, it's got lots of images, fonts, some CSS styling, all that fun stuff. So I'm going to open this up in Visual Studio Code. Feel free to use any other editor of your choice. Okay, and here we are. So this is the HTML document and it's got all of the good stuff to present the front end layer of your static website. Now, you don't have to make any changes to this code, but feel free to play around with it if you so wish. You do need to have a change a single line in this code and specifically it is line number four and five, the URL. Okay, so this is where your invoke URL to invoke the API is going to go in. OK, so this is an important part of this exercise. So let me just bring you back to our AWS Management Console. OK, and then in the API gateway, remember we had this invoke URL, right? So that's the one you want to copy. And then take you back into the application code, into the HTML code, and that's going to go in there. OK, so we're just going to replace that with that. And then what you need to do is just put a slash submit at the end and then save that, okay? So you want to save that piece of code. So that's completed. Next step is we're going to actually create the S3 bucket, upload all of this front-end code, static website code into the bucket, and then we should be able to set it up as a static website hosting service, and hopefully we can then test it out. So back to our AWS Management Console. Let me just go back to Amazon S3. And in Amazon S3, you're going to create a new bucket. Okay, same region, and we're going to call this Belly Brew Web App. Okay, and then scroll all the way down. Untick the box that says block all public access because it's going to be publicly accessible, which means you need to also tick this box that says that you acknowledge that the content will become publicly accessible. Scroll all the way to the bottom and click Create Bucket. OK, so that's our Belly Brew web app. Now, in this, what we need to do next is upload the files. Remember, you've just saved the HTML file you made modifications to. So then you want to click Upload and then just bring up your set of files. Now, what you want to make sure you do is you, as I said earlier, you extract the zip file and then copy the contents of Belly Brew HTML, all of that exactly as it is into the S3 bucket. So you want to upload exactly as it is into the S3 bucket and click upload. OK, there are about 77 files in there. It takes a few, a couple of minutes to upload, depending on the speed of your Internet. 
Okay, and there we are, upload succeeded. Fantastic, so I can click close and you can see that the hierarchy is exactly as it should be. So on the root of the bucket, we've got the index, the error, and the folders with all of the sub content in it. Okay, so that's that done. Now, one thing you've got to remember is that this is going to be a static website and therefore users need to be able to access this from the internet are uh, not authenticated therefore you need to enable anonymous access now we did untick the box that says you know block public access but we still need to give it the right set of permissions if we go to permissions you'll see that there isn't any bucket policy and so at this point in time it is still a private bucket so we need to create a policy that allows members of the public to access the contents of this bucket one quick way and easy way of doing it is to use something called the AWS Policy Generator. Let me take you there. So open up another tab and just type in Google AWS Policy Generator. That should bring up this one here, the Policy Gen. And in there, you want to select S3 Bucket Policy. The effect will be to allow. Anonymous access means you want to put in a wildcard or an asterisk. The action we're going to allow just the one action. We're going to allow the ability to get object to access this static website. So you scroll all the way down. You're looking for get object, which is that one there. OK, and then you need to put the Amazon resource name of your S3 bucket. So back to the bucket again. And if you look at if you go to the bucket policy, click edit over there. You will see that the bucket ARN is accessible. You can find out exactly where it is. Go into the policy generator, paste the ARN in there. Now this is ability to access the bucket, but we want to actually access the contents of the bucket as well. So just add in a comma, repaste the same ARN, followed by a slash and an asterisk. So what we're saying now is that we want to access the contents of the bucket as well. And then you click add statement. So we're going to allow anonymous access, allow get objects, the bucket level and the subcontents of the bucket. And then what we're going to say is generate policy. So you want to copy that. And then you're going to use that as your bucket policy. So we're going to paste it into our bucket policy over there. And you shouldn't get any errors, hopefully. And then you want to click save changes. At this point in time, this bucket is now publicly accessible. OK, so we're almost there. So the next step is to set up this bucket as a static website hosting service. If you go into properties, scroll all the way to the bottom, there is the feature static website hosting that's currently disabled. Edit that feature, click enable. And you want to ensure that you put in the correct index and error documents. So exactly as it is in the folder. So it's these files that we are calling, OK, the index file which is the default page of the website and the error file in case there are any errors and we can't reach the index file. And then click Save Changes. And now your static website service is up and running. Right, next, well, let's test this out. Okay, so step eight is where we're gonna test the website. So remember, we've put in all of the different components of our application. The API Gateway, the Lambda function, the DynamoDB, IAM roles, S3 buckets, the static website, the SES service. All that we need to do is get our user to basically access the website, part with their personal information, their name and email address, hit the submit button, which should trigger a call to invoke the API. The API then triggers the Lambda function. The Lambda function then does all the hard work, wherein it goes and creates a new item in the table with the customer information. It prepares and generates the pre-signed URL, thanks to the permissions that it has in the IAM role. It then queues up the email on SES, and then SES sends across that email to our user that contains the link to the recipe book. Okay, let's go back into the AWS Management Console. And here we are. So remember, we are in our static website bucket. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, there's the URL of the static website that we just created. And fingers crossed, Belly Bruce website is up and running. Good gut health solves all your health issues. And we scroll down. Nice site indeed, uh, if I do say so myself. Um, and this is the form. So grab a copy of our delicious gut friendly recipes and start the new year making one promise to yourself. Say it aloud now. I will love my gut. 
So let's put in our name. Okay, so I've put in my email address there and I'll click submit. And there you go. You get a message saying, thanks, we'll get back to you shortly. I should probably change that and say, we've sent you the email, check it out. Anyway, let's go into my email and see what happened. So I'm gonna go back to my Gmail. Okay, and there you are, get a copy of the book. Okay, and you see it says here, hello Rajesh, um, here's your copy of the requested book. And I'm gonna click the link and it's gonna open up in another browser tab. And this is the book. This is the ebook that I was promised. So it says Belly Brew, Belly Brew Co Limited. It's a PDF document, gut friendly recipes, and it's got a bit of disclaimer there. And then it has all these wonderful recipes. Wow, I think I'm gonna make some nice dinner tonight. Anyway, there you go. So that's how it all works. Okay, so we've been able to create a pre-signed URL. We've been able to fulfill the customer requirements where they want to share this ebook with only those users who sign up. Um, and obviously, you know, we can further tweak the application to make it even more uh, secure. But ultimately, you can see how using a complete serverless design architecture we are able to build a complete end-to-end -end solution for our customer, Belly Brew Co Limited. And we've not used any service there. A lot of the resources that are being used are used on a per consumption model. The website, for instance, you only pay for the amount of storage that you actually consume. The Lambda function, you pay on a per invocation of your Lambda function, you know, rather than having servers running all night long um, and just incurring cost unnecessarily when nobody's busy trying to get your ebook. Um, and all the rest of it. Okay, so it's really far more cost effective. It is really, really much, much more better for the organization. And if you think about the well architected framework, it also fulfills the sustainability pillar using less resources and saving the planet. Very quickly, I also wanted to show you a couple of things in terms of the actual product that we've built. So if I go back into Lambda and if we actually go to functions um, and click on the Lambda function itself and then click on monitor, okay, you will see in fact that this function was invoked once. <laughs> okay, uh, when I made that request. Um, so the Lambda function did work. Okay, so next let's go into the DynamoDB table, go into the profile table. So what we can see is that this is our table. If you look at explore items, we can see that in fact, yes, there is the item, my name and my email address have been added to the database. Okay, so mm -hmm. the marketing department can now send me spam emails <laughs> from Belly Brew Co Limited. Okay, so they got what they wanted and I got my free recipe book. Fantastic. So we see how this all works. Right, if you really enjoyed this um, video and this demonstration, don't forget that I do have all of the codes in the GitHub repository, so you want to download it and test it out yourself. I have one request to ask you. Please go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button and the bell icon. It really encourages me to create more videos like this for you. Thank you. Have a nice day.